Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. This is episode 93. You can catch the links for this episode in the show notes at theaterfolk.com slash episode 93. Today I talked to teacher Ray Pallas, and he had a great time directing a non-traditional play, and I wanted to share that experience with you guys. You know, it comes up a lot. And time and time again, the number one thing I learned from teachers is how students will rise to the occasion. Students are going to perform to whatever expectations you set. And if you set a low expectation of your students, that's what they're going to give to you. So I remember when Craig and I went to our one and only music conference to try and see if there was any interest in our musical, Shout. So Theater Folk has uh, one musical in our catalog. It's called Shout, and it's an acapella musical. And, spoiler alert, uh, no interest. (laughs) There was no interest at this conference. And It was very much pathetic fallacy because the weather was bitter, bitter. Oh my God, it was so cold. And then so was the reception. (laughs) So shout is an acapella musical, which, and I think it's, it's totally logical for high schools to do this musical because how many of schools don't have orchestras? And if you don't want to get into that performing to a track, trap you know like if you don't have an orchestra then you perform to a track which is just not the same as performing to um live musicians so why not do all the singing and with an instrument everybody has the voice but clearly a cappella scares people right it's hard and it is hard and over and over again at this conference, when music teachers would come up to the table and we would tell them what we had and tell them what it was, they would be so they would be so dismissive. My students could never do that. And that breaks my heart because I am constantly amazed at what students can do when the bar is raised. And to be so emphatic, my students can never do that. I'm not quite sure what kind of classrooms that those teachers are in and what those kids are in. If your teacher is saying all the time, oh, my students can never do that, it, uh, it leaves me speechless. So let's hear what Ray has to say with his situation and his students and his very high bar of expectation he has for them. All right, here we are on the Theater Folk Podcast, and I am overjoyed to talk to Ray Palace today. Hello, Ray. Hi. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? Awesome. So just let's start out. And if you could tell everybody uh, where you are in the world. Okay. I am one of the theater directors at Lake Central High School, which is in St. John, Indiana. We are in the northwest corner of the state, about 35 minutes from downtown Chicago. In fact, when I look out my classroom window because of our elevation and I'm on a third floor, on a clear day, I can actually see the skyline of Chicago. So it's kind of cool. How awesome to have that sort of in your backyard. Exactly. Yeah. Are you able to access it to uh, do you see a lot of theater? Yeah, my girlfriend and I, we probably go see about four or five shows a year up there. And I have some friends from college that do shows up there. And every once in a while, I try to get up there when I can to see what they're doing. So I definitely take advantage of it. And I know some of my students do as well. So it's really nice. Cool. So how long have you been a teacher? This is my 10th year. And what got you into it? You know, I had some really good inspirational directors as a child growing up. When I was in middle school, I had people who really directed me well, a guy by the name of Tom Whitting who got me in my first show when I didn't make the basketball team in sixth grade. And then we did a musical together. And then the next year I had this another amazing woman, Gloria Kajeski. She got me through seventh and eighth grade. And then I had a couple of really great directors, Ann Whitting and Henry Hertz in high school. And I grew up outside of Chicago, so this is all in the same area. These are all people that I know, and they got me into theater and developed me even more as an actor and as a director. And actually, it's kind of ironic because the woman, Gloria Kajeski, she 
hysterectomy in seventh and eighth grade. Next year, her daughter will be a freshman in our program here at Lake Central High School. So it's kind of like coming full circle. Absolutely. Yeah. So I had a lot of really good directors growing up who inspired me, who gave me some good opportunities at roles and developed me well. And then that carried on through my experiences at Valparaiso University. So what do you think about their teaching really stuck with you? You know, I think it's the fact that I was exposed to a variety of works. You know, all throughout high school, we did musicals, we did straight plays, we did contemporary pieces, we did some Shakespeare. So I got a lot of experience with different types of theater. They always had fun with what they did, but they impressed upon me a a really strong work ethic that, yes, it's fun. And the end result can be a lot of fun when you look back on it. But, you know, it's 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 work. It's hard work at times. And there are times when, you know, we're not going to be laughing a lot because we're really going to be focused in on what we're doing. And so that really just inspired me. And I love the fact that the power that theater can have. I remember in Illinois, where I grew up, we uh, they have statewide theater competitions. And one of them is Breeders Theater. And junior year, we did an adaptation of Gene Shepard's uh, story, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories, about him going to prom. And it was hilarious. And it was so much fun to put together. And what really I loved the most about it made me realize the power that the year has is when we were competing in the final round of the state finals and we're performing in a classroom setting. And right in front of us is a long table with the five judges. And the judges were laughing so hard that they were slapping the table because it brought such memories for them. And we had brought all of that out for them. And so that was sort of the high end of it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, being able to do other types of shows where we really brought out the emotional part of things. I had the pleasure of working on a production of The Laramie Project when I was doing my student teaching. And even though I didn't have a lot of, say, directorial wise, just observing the process and observing the effect that it had on teenagers across the state of Indiana was really powerful. So I've really been become big into, you know, how can we take a piece of theater and really impact the audience in some way? Awesome. Well, let's get right into it. So is that, would you say, your your prime director's directive is as a high school theater director? When I pick shows, I want to pick shows that are going to give students an opportunity to play different types of characters from what they may have played the last couple of years, but then also give them a chance to do a show that brings something different to the audience. When I pick a one act, it's for a competition. So I need to pick something that is going to have a bit of a competitive edge and be a little bit different. And that actually was one of the big things that uh, the judges at both our regional and our state competition said about it. In fact, one of the judges actually wrote on the score sheet, thank you for giving us something different. Ah, Well, and we should mention that the, um, the play, we were talking about drum taps, right? Yes. Yes. So Drum Taps is my uh, adaptation of Walt Whitman's Civil War poetry. So what sparked you about just that it was just very challenging and different, if I must say so? <laughs> <laughs> that was part of it. Actually, it's a few different things. Like I said earlier, you know, when I was in high school, we did it in Reader's Theater in Illinois. And so I knew that and I really loved it. And the woman who teaches our acting classes had had the students dabble with it a little bit the year before. So I knew the kids had a bit of an introduction to it. But then also, I used to teach a lot of American literature several years ago, and we taught Walt Whitman when we talked about the transcendentalists, and I really love that era and those kinds of poets and what Walt Whitman had to say. And so when I saw this script, it was almost like the perfect storm of theater for me. It had the Reader's Theater, which I was really wanting to try to get into in the next couple of years with the kids, and it had the American literature stuff that I hadn't had much chance to really work with in the classroom. So it was both of those things. And just the way that the poems were laid out to create this really nice arc of a story about the impact that war has. And the more we worked with the show, the more I realized that there's a lot of parallels from what Walt Whitman's talking about in his poetry back in the 1860s and what we experienced over the last 12 years or so as we've been fighting wars in the Middle East. You know, people went into, you know, the Middle East 10 years ago after 9-11, you know, really excited and confident and, you know, we're going to defeat the enemy. And now here we are very war weary Mm -hmm. and, you know, wanting something different and realizing that, you know, war is hell. And I like the way that the, the script was laid out like that. You know, what's actually really horrific is that I'm doing a World War One project right now. 
and it's the exact same thing. I'm reading letters, and it's the exact same thing of that. We're going to go. We're going to go to war. We're going to give them hell. And then, no, it's it's not. And it's I totally agree. That's what's so remarkable about Whitman is that he's it's an experience that we don't seem to be learning from. <laughs> no. Well, so much time passes by and we forget about it. And then it's, you know, oh, yeah, that's right. It is pretty bad, isn't it? So how do you approach a non-traditional play as a director? Well, the first rehearsal that we had, we sat down and read through the script. One of the great things I love about Theater Folks websites, if I may plug you a little bit here, is that you provide access to excerpts of the script. And so one of the things over the summer when I had announced what the show was, you know, on our Facebook page, I put here, if you want to read an excerpt of the script, here you go, here you go. And then when the school year started, we still had a few weeks before audition. So I said, you know, you can go ahead and read, you know, I've got copies of the script, go ahead and check them out. But only a couple of my cast members had actually really read the script. Others had just read his poetry in general and so knew a little bit about him. So we read through it and I didn't really preface it with much of anything. I let the actors kind of be shocked, be surprised, be confused by the way it was laid out, especially with the chorus type lines. And then I explained a little bit about what Reader's Theater was about because they had, some of them had seen the Reader's Theater production from the year before. And uh, just while you just want, you just throw in a brief, what you feel your definition of, of Reader's Theater is in. Oh gosh. Right here. My definition of Reader's Theater is that it's theater that really breaks down the fourth wall and brings the audience onto the stage to experience the story. And so everything we really did was designed to pull the audience in to make them feel like they're a part of that war and, and the experiences that these soldiers are going through. So as we, you know, read through the script and they, you know, you know, had the nervous giggles about the challenges of getting these lines said clearly and together and in unison, I really put the script in their hands. I knew some of the things I wanted to see in some of the pieces, but I said, I want you to just experiment with it. You know, poetry is meant to be read out loud. So read it out loud. Find those key words, verbs in there that indicate some sort of action you might be doing or the character you might be playing and try some things out. And what was interesting is, you know, we had four actors in our show and then we had four or five technicians and we all were at every single rehearsal. And so I had actually the technicians out in the audience. They were watching and we would do one excerpt, we would look at one poem, they would play around with it. And then the actors would say, well, let's try doing this. Let's see what we do here. And I would ask them some questions about choices they made and, and characters they were trying to, to go to play. And then the technicians would chime in with, well, you know, here's how I am, you know, here's how it looks from the audience's perspective. So we had sort of that immediate feedback from an audience by way of our technicians. And that's, that's really how we approached it. Because I didn't want it to be me playing this one man game of chess with these actors on the stage. I wanted them to really absorb the, the literature and really get into the to owning what they were doing on stage and make it more natural. Why did you think that was important for a play like this? Well, I think it's to me, it's, it's, it's or any play. <laughs> one of the ways I direct in general. Uh, but I think for a play like this, it's really important because it's poetry and the actors need to be able to understand it. And, you know, we, we did some book work where we looked at lines and I had, you know, we had dictionaries out and I actually had a copy of, you know, Leaves of Grass out. And we were looking at the comparisons and, and, and what the words were saying. But it was just so important for them to really understand and make those discoveries and struggle with it. They, I mean, they did struggle with it. And there were times where I could tell that, you know, after going to school for six and a half hours, and coming to rehearsal for two hours that, you know, sometimes by, you know, an hour in, I could tell their their eyes were glazing over, their brains were a bit worn out because we had everything going on and then they were tackling this stuff. And so, but it was really important for them to, to struggle with it because I think too often I see students who just expect the answer to be given to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in my English classes, they just want me to tell them what the poem is about. They want me to tell them what the story is about. And I really wanted to force them to make those discoveries on their own. And they even had conversations with themselves. There were times where, you know, one person would start talking about a choice they made and then another actor would start talking and responding and, and chiming in. And all of a sudden they had a conversation going, I'm just sitting there, big old smile on my face, just saying, this is why I love directing because I want them to make those discoveries. So, and especially for a piece like this, because it is so tough, 
you know, I was there to, to catch them wherever they might stumble. But I think it was just really important for them to, to grasp that on their own and make those discoveries on their own. And they get it. I think they really matured so much as actors. You know, this was our contest piece. And I always say that my contest shows are like the varsity football team. You know, you, you're taking the best of the best. And these four actors that showed up were the only four actors I had audition. They were amazing. And most of the people, when I told them afterwards uh, at the competitions that, you know, these were the only four that showed up and I told them some of their backgrounds, they said, are you kidding me? Because I have one of them as a freshman this year. One and the other three have never really had big roles before. One is a senior who did some supporting roles, but never really had the opportunity to shine as, as a, a lead role. And the other two were girls who are sophomores. And of course, in high school, if you're a girl in theater, you are, you know, it's a cat fight to get those parts because you have so much competition. And neither of them up to that point had, had any major roles either. They had a lot of walk-ons. And so to be able to see them develop and struggle with it really made me proud to see that they could do it. And they gained, I think, a new sense of confidence in themselves as performers as a result. Well, when you talk about the power of theater, that's it right there, isn't it? It is. It really is. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. That's amazing. It's, it's just I, I'm sitting here with a big smile on my face going, oh, I see those are my favorite stories. My favorite stories are always the underdog stories. I always want to hear about how somebody's grown because of their participation, you know, as opposed to someone who's a can can sing, dance and act up a storm. Yes. Yeah. And, and we had um, the, the one newspaper covered us a couple of about a month ago as we were getting ready for a benefit performance. And one of the actors was responding to questions about, you know, what have they learned? How have they grown? And they said, you know, it's amazing because it's actually helped me in my English classes as we've been writing stuff and reading poetry. And I, I have this better sense of what I'm doing in there because I grappled with it on the stage. And, and to me, that's like, yeah, you, like you said, that's the power of theater is that it's, it's more than just an entertainment venue. It's life. Mm -hmm. Oh, hundred percent. How did you deal with, um, because it's poetry and it's really easy to um, make it a static presentation. I, and I really tried in the script to, to inject as much as possible, but how did you deal with the physicality of making sure that they were, that there was some action on stage? Well, first of all, we looked at trying to figure out who these four actors were going to be as people in the war. What were they doing before the war? And it took a couple of weeks for them to really figure it out. And it came in the first couple of poems in the piece, you know, that one was a farmer, that one was a doctor, one was a scholar. And so they started to discover that. And then that kind of trailed into uh, how things went. You know, the scholar became the, the infantry leader in uh, a few of the pieces. And so it started with figuring out who they were as human beings before the war. And then, you know, how did it affect each of those people as they were going through the war? You know, the scholar experienced it a little bit differently than the farmer, than the doctor. And so that was really kind of how we, we, we worked from there. We did bring props into it. We bought some prop Civil War type rifle pieces. We have you know, a book for the scholar. We made a, a wooden crate with rope handles that we put a blanket into. And so we had some some props here and there to help signify some things. And then we played around with pantomiming as well to really act out what they're doing. For instance, when they're, um, and I can't think of the piece because there's uh, the wound dresser, for instance, where they're bandaging up the wounded. You know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how are you doing this? And, you know, they struggle with pantomiming. And so, you know, because there are four people, I said, OK, pair up. And um, we went and we got some rolls of paper towels. And I said, you know, here's the motion you are going to do over and over again. And you're going to practice it on each other until it's in your muscle memory. And it was kind of funny because we were doing this in a hallway because we couldn't be in the auditorium at the time. And <laughs> we had some people walking by who weren't in theater and they just kind of were staring at us like, well, that's interesting. <laughs> But, you know, they it helped them understand what they need to do with the pantomime. Well, wow, and what a fantastic thing to go. OK, we don't know how to do this. Well, let's do it as opposed to not doing it, like letting them struggle with it. Yeah. Love it. OK, so what would you say was the, your most challenging moment in the rehearsal process? What was the most the one that stood out that you had to that sticks out in your memory? I think the thing that just I and it's one thing that we still every once in a while struggle with even at this point of the process. And it's 
getting the lines right. You know, students have this habit of approximating lines every once in a while. And in pro scripts, even though I tell my actors, no, that is still wrong. You need to write it, say it the way the, the playwright wrote it because they wrote it a certain way for a reason. In poetry, it's even, it, it's even more important because there are certain words that Whitman chose to use and you can't just say it a certain way, the way you want to. You have to say it the way he wrote it. So we did struggle with that and, and we still, you know, look at scripts every once in a while when we're in rehearsal and I go, okay, that's not the line. So that's really, I think, the thing that overall, you know, has been our biggest struggle because it is poetry. Was it just uh, repeating and repeating and repeating? Is that how they, making it muscle memory that way too? Is that how you worked it? Yes, that and, you know, their assignment, especially early on, was every night you take 20 minutes and you go over your lines and you read them out loud. You know, I said, if you read it in your head, I go, you're not moving the mouth and the tongue and the articulators. And so you're not really practicing it full force. You have to actually say the words out loud. So your mouth and your tongue and all of your articulators are understanding how it is supposed to go. And, and that has really helped in, in terms of getting the lines right. Oh, I think that's a great piece of advice. Okay, and now what was your most rewarding moment? When did you know that it was all going to work out and come together? Well, we had 12 rehearsals before we went into regional competition, which I didn't even realize that it was only 12 rehearsals until after we performed at regionals. And they did a really great job. And they were talking with some people from another school. And they go, wow, that was really good. How long have you been working on that thing? And they go, well, we only had 12 rehearsals. And they're like, what? Only 12 rehearsals? I don't even know when I felt it, it, it was going to come together. I always knew that this group had the potential. But I would say probably about halfway through the process, I was really getting a sense that this was going to happen. And it wasn't necessarily because of what they were doing on the stage. It was because of the people that I was working with. You know, so often you get the, in high school theater, you get the division between actors and technicians that creeps up or you get the issue of, you know, lead actors with big egos that, you know, look down upon the little people in the ensemble. And that didn't happen. And I remember, you know, one day I was doing some one on one work with two of the girls and they came to me and they said, you know, there's some people who don't think we're going to be able to repeat because the last Last year, we took first at regionals, and they think it was a fluke, and, and they were obviously upset about it. And so they let me know, and I said, look, I go, we can do this. There's not a doubt in my mind we can do this. I said, you know, I don't have to do this show, but I chose to do it because you guys came out for it, and you're a great group of people personally, and I want to do the show with you guys. And that was a little bit before halfway through the process. But a couple of days later, as we're rehearsing, I'm just watching all this happen. And I'm thinking, everybody's just like, they're doing their own thing. They're supporting each other. They're really wanting this thing to come together. I think I told you in an email early on that, you know, we originally wanted to do the large cast version, which, you know, I was hoping to, you know, have about 10 or 12 people in it. And then I only got four people. And your small cast version calls for five. So we had a, a we had a great laugh that first rehearsal trying to split up the fifth person line for everyone else. But it was just the attitude of everybody that I really got the sense about halfway through that even though at first I think they were feeling a little bit timid and nervous that this may not really work out, that by about the sixth rehearsal, everybody was feeling like, we can do this. This is something that we can do and we are going to be proud of. And we're going to give it everything we've got. And even if you don't make it on the state conference, we're going to go out there and give them hell. And that was the moment. I think that was the most rewarding moment for me because, you know, as you said earlier, you know, and I'm the same way too, believing in the underdog, really trying to bring that person who maybe doesn't get the lead roles and really working with them to develop them. I love it when they get on stage and it makes the audience go, where have you been? And, and what have you, why have you not been doing theater? And then they go, I have been doing theater. I just haven't had a big role before. And those are the moments I like the most. So. Sometimes all they need to hear is that, that someone believes that they can do it. Yes. I truly believe that re teenagers, they just, they just want someone to tell them that they've done a good job. Yes. And that's why, I, you know, sometimes it just, it just breaks my heart, particularly in, judic in adjudication situations where some, someone feels it necessary to rip someone to shreds. And I'm like, you know, I think there was a, a different way to do that. And they will rise to the level and the expectation that you set. And one of the things that we did this year in Indiana that we haven't done 
before, as far as I can remember, is after each show performed, the judges actually sat at one part of the theater and the, the, the cast and crew came over. Anybody else who wanted to come listen would come listen. And the judges would sit and respond and talk about what they saw and the things that they liked and the things that they thought needed more work. And that was the great thing was our judges were very good about not saying, oh, that stunk, but to say, you know, if you want to make this better, here's what you can try and actually offering suggestions. And I think that's really important because, you know, it is educational theater when it comes down to it. And they're, they're developing, they're learning. They don't know all the tricks of the trade and the high school director can't give them all the tricks of the trade and certainly not in 12 rehearsals. And so having that outside feedback of somebody who can say, you know what, I've done this kind of thing before. Try this. This might work. And then when it actually works and it's like, yeah, see, they, they knew what they were talking about. So I, and I, that's what I love about what I get to do as an educator is seeing that change and that development. And then, you know, I mean, I learned so much even from just listening to the adjudicators. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. OK, one last question. So what advice would you give to uh, teachers who might be scared by a non-traditional script who are one of those who, who might say, oh, you know, my students could never do this? What advice would you give to them? Take the risk. You know, we talk about acting as, as taking risks on stage. Take the risk. Have confidence in your actors. And actually, in, in, in hindsight, I don't know if I would have had the kind of experience I did have if I had done the large cast version, if I had all those people. It just worked really well with the small group. But the, the idea of taking that risk, playing around with it, and it may not turn out the way you wanted it to when all is said and done, but then you've got something to work on for next time. When I was in college, one of my professors talked about theater as, as basically like a science experiment. And, you know, before you start production, you make some hypothesis about how you think this is going to go. And then, you know, the production is the procedure through the whole process. And then when you're all done, that's when you've got your results from the performances and you make your conclusions. And as long as you approach it from no production is ever a failure, that every production has results and conclusions you can draw for next time. I think that is the most important thing to keep in mind. And as long as you as the director have a handle on what you're doing. Just like a teacher, you know, you have a handle on what you're doing so you can guide the kids. They'll follow you. You know, I've hinted it to the kids that next year I'm looking at doing a Shakespeare piece, actually from theater folk. I came across a Shakespeare cutting that I'm really intrigued to do. And some of them go, really more poetry. But this is actually like going back to, you know, traditional theater. This isn't reader's theater and it's, it's different and we haven't done Shakespeare. And it's like, you know, I know what I'm doing here. Now take the risk. But that's what I always encourage you. Take the risk. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me today. No problem. My pleasure, Lindsay. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. I just love hearing how students who aren't supposed to succeed, who aren't expected to succeed, and oh, they just shine, shine, shine. I love it. I love it. You can get the show notes for this episode at theaterfolk.com slash episode 93. So before we go, let's do some theater folk news. Drum Taps, very much a non-traditional piece of theater. And uh, I'm just going to talk just a bit about my non-traditional musical, Shout, which I so dearly, dearly love. It comes in a one-act version and a full length. And it has to do with what happens when you keep feelings inside. We have... uh, in the full length, we have four teenagers and we're following four stories and each teenager is just, they have something very specific going on inside of them that they don't talk about. You know, whether it's family issues or characters who want to break up with each other and they, and they won't say the words. When you're feeling alone and you keep everything bottled up inside, these are the stories of Shout and what happens when you don't let it out. The music was designed specifically for student performers. It was written by Christian Gauthier, who spent many years performing professionally. She toured with Les Mis and then went into the classroom. So she knows both worlds and she knows how to write music for students so that they are able to sing it. Head on over to theaterfolk.com slash shout. We've got the full libretto you can read. You can hear the music. You can watch students perform. You can watch students 
talk about their experience performing Shout and just that whole notion of expectation and raising the bar. And I just remember the first production that did it, I asked a student why they thought that they could do it. And very clearly, she said it was because our teacher believed in us and told us we could do it. And we thought, yeah, why not? We can do this. Theaterfolk.com slash shout. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk. You can find us on the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search on the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. Take care.